Okay, I'm opening this series on a game of life I've been working on for about a year, so I hope the first one goes okay, because <laughs> otherwise you just can the whole thing and you know, go back to whatever. Uh, that's a disclaimer. But I've been working on it for about a year. Don't know how long it's going to run. We'll just see, but uh, we're going to pick up on the things that we do that's kind of like a game. Um, I would like for us to begin by reading Psalm 90, verses 1 to 6, and verses 10 and 12. And let's do that. Here we go. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Thou turnest man back to the dust, and sayest, Turn back, O children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Thou dost sweep men away, they are like a dream, like grass which is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. The years of our life are threescore and ten, or even by reason of strength, fourscore, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would take the words that I speak today and work them into our lives. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would give each of us a message for our lives, in terms of this game that we're in, the game of life. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, well, if you've been working on this for a year. But while, in a lot of things, I've been working in the game of life for a lot of years. I have pretty much come to the conclusion that one of our biggest dilemmas, and maybe the number one dilemma, is this. Over and over again, we lose sight of what is important and what isn't. Over and over again, we lose sight of what is important and what isn't. I've come to realize that one of life's hardest lessons to learn is the absolute necessity of building our lives around what really matters in light of our own mortality and the eternal nature of our souls. Moses pretty much nailed it here in Psalm 90 when he said in verse 12, he said, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. There's not one of us is going to get out of here alive. I realize the myth is <laughs> that you're the only one that's going to live forever. And the rest of us are going to die. It's kind of like a benediction that I give. May you live forever and the last voice you hear be mine. But there's not one of us going to get out of here alive, and the sooner that reality becomes part of our worldview, the quicker we will take a larger view of what really matters in this life. So in the game of life, the first rule is to begin with the end in mind. What really matters? Because everything either has meaning or nothing has meaning. So rule number one, is to build your life, your day, and our relationships around what really matters. Since none of us are going to get out of here alive. Life is very much like a game. In fact, I think a lot of our games are patterned after life. Now, I'm a gamer. <laughs> and I've been a pretty good one over the years at times. Since, in fact, how many have done the strength finder stuff? My number one strength is the attributes strategic. So I've always been pretty good in games like Risk, which is about world domina uh, uh, domination. Trivial Pursuit is easy because I have all kinds of trivial information in my head. Go to the head of the class, which is what is the old chutes and ladders. Then there are others like Parcheesi and Rook and Chess and Checkers and Canasta and Pinochle and all kinds of games. 
growing up, I even played a board game called Going to Jerusalem, which I got right. Can you believe this? Going to Jerusalem. It's kind of like going to the head of the class, but the tricky part was answering the questions about Jesus and the Gospels and finding them and everything. True story, my brother and I played one time, played the game Going to Jerusalem for $100 a game one day. True story. I lost. My kids don't like to play with me. Well, some of them don't like to play with me because I don't cut them any slack because I don't like to lose. Now, the game that is probably most played, most well-known is Monopoly, which is right here. In fact, a lot of these kids played it. Monopoly. How many of you played Monopoly before? Ah, so I'm talking to everybody almost. And if you haven't played it, where have you been? <laughs> Monopoly. It's the game Donald Trump plays. Really? Here's a trivial fact about me. When I was in college, this is true, during my junior year, the college decided to have a Monopoly tournament and so my fraternity brothers dared me to enter it, so I did. I won the tournament. <laughs> I wheeled and dealed my way through several games until I accumulated the most money and property of all the people in the tournament, and I sucked the blood out of a lot of people in those things. And you know, and you know what happened after I won? It all went back in the box. So you go back to rule number one. What really matters in light of our own mortality and eternity? And as a gamer, I want to teach you how to play the game of life in 2016. If you are a parent, and I'm think if you are a parent, your task for your kids and your household is to define reality. What really matters? That's part of the parent's job. If you are a teacher in one of our schools, part of your job is to define reality to those who are your students and really what matters. If you are a boss or a civil servant or an elected official in society, part of your job is to define reality and what really matters. Do you know what really matters in light of your own mortality and eternity? You know, there is so much confusion in our world about what really matters. So many opinions. When it comes to the game of life, my job as your pastor, part of what I do as a spiritual leader in this community and in this church is to help define reality in light of the fact that in the long run, we're all dead. While we play this game called church, I play to win. But part of that winning strategy is to keep an eye on what kinds of people or disciples you are becoming as you grow in faith. I'm here to help you learn how to play the game of life. Rule number one, what really matters? In the light of the fact that in the long run, we're all dead. In games like Risk and Monopoly, the board is a risky place. But in the game of life, the board or the journey uh, in life we travel is also a risky place. And there are no do-overs. I know that in computer games and stuff like that, you can just push the reload button and you can do it over. But there are no do-overs in the game of life unless you believe in reincarnation. Sometimes we as people determine that the goal of life is power or money or position in society. Sometimes it's about fame or maybe it's about security. Sometimes it's about that guy 
or that girl. In the game of life, that journey that you are traveling on, what really matters, especially if you don't believe the myth that you're the only one who is going to get out of this world alive. But a lot of us believe that myth, but if you don't believe it, and you know you're not going to get out of here alive. Now, I don't know if you've seen the t-shirt or bumper sticker that says, the guy with all the toys wins the game. Really? I mean, really? When the game's over, who gets all the toys? His toys, then. But some chase that pipe dream. Once again, my job is to help you define reality and keep an eye on what you are becoming and to help you grow in the things that are eternal in nature. In the journey of life, the board is a risky place. This is a risky place, folks. We need to be mindful of our own death when the game is over. I have a cut from the movie Aliens when the game was over, when all kinds of hell broke loose and it looked like the end was here. And I've seen people in these kinds of situations. Well, that's great. That's just really great, man. Now what are we supposed to do? Where's the real pretty hell, man? You finished. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. What are we going to do now? What are we going to do? Now, I've seen people in those kinds of life situations. That's just a picture of a of way things can be. And I expect the greatest lesson comes at the end of the game, when the game is over. But then it may be too late. One of the things that I have discovered about life is that life is really about movement. When kids are sick, they quit moving. Have you noticed that, parents? They, they get quiet. If they're full of life, they're always moving. But if they're sick, they get, the, they get real quiet. But if they got all that life, they're always moving. I have a dog like that. A tornado on four legs. Movement. Movement is life. You can tell if a church is alive or dead, whether or not anything is going on or not. If there's no movement, there's no life. When I came back to Decatur at Woodland Chapel, I noticed something. There was very little movement at that church. Woodland Chapel was sick unto death. The Christian education wing smelled of mold. The lights were very dim. Nothing was going on. And for two weeks, I saw no children. The only thing that was going on was really Sunday morning worship. You know, when you go into a church, you can tell pretty quickly if it is alive or not. Um, movement is the key. Because movement is life. That's why it says in so Psalm 23, that when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, you keep walking. Read it, let's read it together. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now notice here, this is one of these things where I pick it up. Notice it says, when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, you keep moving, walking. God may be there to protect you, but don't sit down. You keep moving so that the buzzers, buzzards don't gather like they do around roadkill. Movement. Jerry Seinfeld gave us some insight into movement. He said, to me, if, the, if life boils down to one significant thing, it's movement. That's what he said. To live is to keep moving. Unfortunately, this means that for the rest of our lives, we're going to be looking for boxes. When you are moving, your whole world is boxes. Well, here, I'll let Jerry explain it to you. 
Your whole world becomes boxes. That's all you think about is boxes. Where are there boxes? You just wander down the street going in and out of stores. Are there boxes here? Have you seen any boxes? I mean, it's all you think about. You can't even talk to people because you can't concentrate. Shut up! I'm looking for boxes! <laughs> Just after a while, you become like really into it. You could smell them. You walk in the store. There's boxes here. Don't tell me you don't have boxes. Damn it, I can smell them. I'm like obsessed. I love the smell of cardboard in the morning. You could be at a funeral. Everyone's mourning, crying around. You're looking at the casket. That's a nice box. Does anybody know where that guy got that box? Well, he's done with it. You think I could get that? It's got some nice handles on it. And that's what death is, really. It's the last big move of your life. The hearse is like the van. The pallbearers are your close friends. The only ones you could really ask to help you with a big move like that. And the casket is that great, perfect box you've been looking for your whole life. The only problem is, once you find it, you're in it. You could be a funeral. Everyone around you is mourning, crying, and you're looking at the casket. That's a nice box. Does anybody know where that guy got that box? What's he done with it? You could... Think I could get it when he's done with it? Nice handles. My stereo would fit in that box. <laughs> That's what death really is, isn't it? Really? The last big move of your life. And he makes light of this because if you don't, you're going to cry anyway. The casket is that great, perfect box you've been looking for your whole life. Every story I know ends with it. I know this every time I lead a worship service at a funeral. I know that every casket has a story. And there's a story in every casket. What's your story? See, learning rule number one in the game of life is learning what really matters understanding we're not going to get out of here alive. It's not bad to play the game of life, and it's not bad to be really good at it. It's not bad to be good at your job or your profession. It's not bad to be good at making money or gaining position and power. The real danger is in forgetting to ask the question, what really matters in this game of life? We run around that board with our frenzied schedules and our shallow relationships and our preoccupied souls of what we're supposed to be doing, we fall prey to what I call the tyranny of the urgent. And not really paying attention to the end of the game. In the game of life, being smart, strong, rich, powerful, or even spiritual does not protect you from death when the game is over. When you are young, and I got some here, you guys over here in high school, when you're young, it might be the, be the race and challenge of good grades or maybe being class president or that girl or that guy. Then graduation comes, and that part of the game is over, and the game goes to a different level, and the pressures of the game is about winning that job, making money, being successful, finding and getting that perfect guy or girl, and around the board we go, throwing the dice on the wheel of fortune, you might say. We pass somebody up, and we feel pleasure. Or someone passes me, and I feel this stab of pain inside of me. And depending on what makes us tick, we ask the questions in the game of life. Is it enough? Did I do good? Does it mean anything? Have I been guilty of self-gratification at the destruction of other people? And so it goes around the board. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. In the game of life, at least in this country, there is this goal in the game for financial security. Now, you know, that's a well-planned retirement in an active senior community that is gated. 
Some seek eternal youth from Botox or hair dye. Or, and we can take our blood pressure pills or our Viagra or some other chemicals to make sure we look good and can continue to keep walking in the valley of the shadow. Better living through chemistry. Then one day it all stops. Other people keep going on the board of the game of life, but for you, the game is over. Some are just starting somewhere on the board on the game of life, but your day's out. Did you play wisely? I hear, I hear a lot of people talk. I listen to my own muddled thinking at times. It seems that a lot of us want God in our lives, but left to our own devices, you know what we go after? We seek all the worldly things, possessions, money, looks, youth, power, relationships, because we think they will give us fulfillment or save us. The truth is, for most, this is just a bad joke. And what we do is we get off on track for, and we can't get off the, this locomotive that we're on, this train we're on, and we know that it's not a bad joke. And in the end, all those things are just pieces on the board in the game of life. And when the game is over, we give them all back. And guess what? They're all put back in the box again. They are just part of the game. Game pieces. They aren't ours, really. Which brings me back to rule number one. The object of the game. What really matters? Over and over again, we lose sight of what really matters and what doesn't. You know, part of my job as teacher, spiritual leader, pastor is to help define reality for myself first because if I can't define it for myself, how am I going to dispense it to anybody else? And you know, if I stand up here and I don't know what's going on, it's not going to work very good. So part of it is to help define reality for myself first, and then you as we play this game of life together. Part of our dilemma is that we know that this game will end, even if we believe it be, it's a myth for ourselves personally, but we know in the back of our mind, no, it's not really a myth. It's really going to happen to me too. This is our curse. This is our warning. This is also our opportunity. The Jewish Talmud teaches that every person should truly repent and change one day before his death. But the question always comes, well, how will I know when that day is? That's the dilemma, isn't it? My best advice is treat every day as if it were the day before your last. Build your life around what matters most. That's rule number one. So what is it that really matters? The last verses in Ecclesiastes pretty much states it. So let's read Ecclesiastes 12, verses 11 to 14. Here we go. The sayings of the wise are like goads. And like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings which are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anyone beyond this. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That scripture has always intrigued me for a couple of reasons. One is, he says, the making of books, there is no end. This was written 2,800 years ago. How many books do you think they had back then? You can go in, I'll tell you what, you can go in my office, I probably got more books than he's ever seen. Of the making of books, writing of books, there is no end. That's the one thing that I said. Now, you're going to have to also determine whether I am wise or not when I hit you with a cattle prod. 
And whether my Velcro saying stick to you like nails fixed to a wall. But I am one shepherd and my job is to help you define reality in this game of life. And there's so many things going on around us all the time. We don't stop to think because we're too busy going around the board. Verse 13 here says it pretty succinctly. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Rule number one, basically. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, you decide. Now, the focused answer for us is Jesus and the life that he gives us. But I know that each of us has to decide what he or she believes. And what we believe constitutes winning or losing in this game of life. We're all on the board moving around it right now. But I also know there is a story in every casket but I also know there is a casket in every story. But for today, the casket will wait. So let's end by reading 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Well, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I pummel my body and subdue it, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Remember rule number one. What matters? And so play to win in 2016. Let's pray.